Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about switches and switch protection methods by looking at the use case of switching converters. Just like with any other circuit, the switches in a switch mode power supply need to withstand the operating conditions, so you need to ensure the voltage and current does not exceed the component limits, but unlike a mechanical switch, you may also have the issue of noise, which also needs to be tackled. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. Today I will be focusing on buck converters, just to keep things simple. But the same principles apply regardless of power supply topology. So to start things off, let's look at the two fundamental problems that you can encounter with the switches in a switching converter. So what I have here is an older board I've built for a buck converter and if we turn on the supply, so I'm supplying it with 10 volts, I have a active load connected to it and we have a look into the switching node of the circuit, we can see quite a nice waveform appearing. So we have our textbook square wave. But this isn't really what I want to show you, but rather it's something that you might even miss if you don't set up your measurement equipment properly. So right now I have my 20 MHz bandwidth limit, waveform looks very nice. If we activate the full bandwidth and we remeasure, we see a slightly different story. So especially on this rising edge, if we zoom in a bit, we can see that the voltage reaches some very high voltage levels. So it should stay at 10 volts, the supply voltage, yet it goes to around 14 volts. And while we also have this very unpleasant high frequency oscillation appearing. And now both of these elements, the high voltage that is being achieved, as well as the high frequency noise, could end up causing problems in your practical design. The existence of the voltage spikes, the overshoot and undershoot in the switching node, means that your switch components are being exposed to higher than expected voltages. In other words, if these components were chosen strictly based on the theoretical voltages that you should be seeing, you might end up destroying the switches. So if you have a 35 volt supplied circuit, you will be using 40 volt rated transistors to be on the safe side, but if your spikes are at 41 volts, well then you're gonna have a bad time. The other issue at hand is the ringing. This will pose problems if you have a noise sensitive circuit or if your product needs to pass emission compliance tests. This ringing usually occurs at very high frequency, completely unrelated to the power supply's switching frequency. So a typical emission spectrum of a supply will contain the fundamental switching frequency, its upper harmonics, which slowly die down, and then another noise mountain appears, which is related to this ringing. Usually this will be in the tens to hundreds of megahertz, and because the frequency is so high, this is very difficult to filter out. So in case you do have one or both of these issues, you will probably want to solve them. The common and most basic way is to add an RC snubber. But before doing that, it's important to understand that it's not the only way. And furthermore, the snubber is more of a band-aid. It does not eliminate the fundamental problem, it just hides it. It's far better, if the design allows it of course, to tackle the root cause. So why do you get your overshoot and ringing in the first place? Well, let's start by looking at what we are supposed to be getting. So with a basic buck converter, the two switches are driven one at a time, you should never have both of them on at the same time to prevent the short circuiting of the power supply, and with this driving scheme, the switching node will transition between the supply voltage and zero. And at the same time, the current in the switches is also noteworthy. So when the high side switch is on, current rises, the inductor is supplied from the battery, and when the low side switch is on, current drops as the inductor current discharges. Now, to get a bit closer to real life, the two switches will always have a bit of a delay in between their driving signals. This is needed to ensure that they 
will never be driven at the same time, even under real life conditions. And to keep the current continuously flowing through the inductor, there is always a diode in parallel with the low side switch. It's either built in into the transistor or it's an added component. Because of this, the waveforms slightly change. The voltage in the switching node drops to negative values when the diode is conducting. The exact amount being the diode's forward voltage. And then the current goes through the diode when neither of the transistors is being driven. Finally, when you have a single switch buck converter, the diode fully takes over the role of the second switch, conducting when the high side switch isn't. So here the switching node will oscillate between the input voltage and the forward voltage of the diode. Now, to start comparing the theory to reality, let's start by looking at the test fixture of a switch mode power supply that is already present in LT Spice. The fixture for the LTC3823, a synchronous buck converter. Now, if we run the simulation and have a look into the switching node, let's just pause this and we zoom in a bit, we see the typical waveform that we should be having here. So the switching node varies between the supply voltage, 12 volts, down to negative something value when the diode is conducting, and then back to zero when the low side is also switched on. Now, if we check the currents through the three main components, so the current in the drain of the high side switch, the current in the drain of the low side switch, and the current in the diode, we start to see the first differences compared to what we discussed previously. Other than the trapezoid currents, we start to see some spikes appearing. And the simple answer to why this is, has to do with the parasitic capacitances of the various components. The switches are not perfect. They all have some amount of built-in parallel capacitance. So when we also consider this capacitance, when one switch closes, apart from the useful inductor that should be going through it, it also ends up discharging its own parallel capacitance and charging the ones from the other components, leading to current spikes. This is most obvious on the high side switch. The moment when this turns on, its own parallel capacitance was charged to the supply voltage and the other capacitor to a negative voltage. And as the switch transitions, both of these capacitors need to change their potential. Therefore, there is a large current spike. The low side transistor does not see this problem, or at least not to this extent, since its parallel capacitance needs to switch from the forward voltage to zero, and the same variation is also occurring on the other parallel capacitance. Finally, the other large transition should be occurring on the diode, but this usually switches slow enough so that no major issues occur. Now, the simulation did show some spikes also appearing on the low side switch, but this is mainly because the current we are monitoring is not just the switch current, but rather the switch current plus the parallel capacitance current. So the spikes were not occurring during the monitored switch transition, but rather when the other switch was transitioning and we were seeing part of this current on our second switch. So this mostly explains the current spikes to which the switches will get exposed to. But we still have no voltage ringing. What's missing from the simulation? Well, parasitic inductance. Every trace, and for that matter, every component pin, will have some amount of series inductance. If we add about 10 nano Henrys in series with the two transistors, and we rerun the simulation, and we have a look into the switching node, well, the waveform completely changes. So it's the same basic shape. You have your high level somewhere at 12 volts, the low level somewhere at minus something the forward voltage, but then you have this extra oscillation appearing. And if we look really closely, the oscillation when the voltage is high is at about 63 megahertz, whereas the other oscillation is at about 94 megahertz. So what happened? Where did this come from? Well, a more complete model that takes into consideration the various parasitics of interest of a buck converter will look something like this. Your interconnecting traces have both inductance and resistance, and the components, the transistors and the decoupling capacitors all have series inductance, and while the transistor switches also have their parallel capacitance and the built-in diode. Now, all of the components in the diagram have parasitics, 
but our main area of interest is our hot loop, the input decoupling capacitor to which the two switches are connected. Now, even though it's not part of the problem directly, another parasitic worth mentioning is the inductor's parallel capacitance. This, together with the parallel capacitance of the high side switch, will take the voltage noise from the switching node and couple it directly into the supply lines. So your noise will not be focused in on the supply, but it will also be able to couple outwards. Now, we can redraw our hot loop a bit to highlight our problem. So when one switch is closing and the other one is open, we are generating a square, or to be more accurate, a trapezoid wave that ends up driving a RLC series circuit. Based on the exact component values and the slope of the transition, we will get a better or worse result. Now, there are a few measures that can be implemented though to reduce our problem, but not all of them are feasible or things that you really want to do. So, to highlight these measures, I took the basic RLC series circuit and I'm using a square wave to drive it. The exact component values are arbitrary, so it's just something to be able to make some comparisons. First thing to look at is the damping factor. So this can be increased by increasing the resistance or the capacitance or by decreasing the inductance. So if we run these circuits and compare them a bit, so if we take the reference signal in green, compare it to the response of the circuit with increased resistance and the one with increased capacitance, we can see that in both cases the exact amplitude has decreased, as well as the number of oscillation cycles has decreased. But these two measures are something that you don't normally want to do, because increasing the capacitance or the resistance will have a direct impact on the total losses of the circuit. If we now look at the response of the circuit with decreased inductance, again we see the same effect, we have a decrease in amplitude and decrease in number of cycles, and this is the first major measure that is worth considering. Because by decreasing the inductance, you do not increase losses. Final thing to notice is that when you vary the inductance or the capacitance, the exact oscillation frequency will also change. So with less inductance we have a higher frequency, with more capacitance we have a lower frequency. This did not happen when we changed the resistance. There the frequency stayed the same, just the amplitude was affected. Now another thing to consider is the exact transition time. How fast are your switches actually switching? To highlight the impact of this, I took our reference circuit and just changed the applied waveforms transition times. So we have three different transition times, 100 nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds, and 1 nanosecond. And if we run this simulation and look into the waveform present on the capacitor, we can see we are getting different effects. So all of these transition times generate some amount of oscillation, but the exact amplitude is larger when a faster transition is occurring. So the blue waveform is occurring for the one nanosecond transition time. Now to understand why this is happening, we can look at the base waveform and analyze its FFT spectrum. What we can notice here is that the faster the transition time is, so green is the one nanosecond one, red is the 100 nanosecond one, the more high frequency content the waveform contains. So we can take advantage of this behavior in two ways. One would be to increase the slope, which will reduce the oscillation, but it will again increase losses. And the other is to change the resonant frequency. So if we decrease the capacitor, we will get a smaller damping factor, which should cause us more problems. But if we compare this waveform to the original reference, what we can see is that the amplitude did decrease. So the oscillation is going on for more cycles, but at a smaller amplitude. The reason for this being that the exciting wave, so our pulse source, has less energy at this higher frequency than it did at the lower frequency of the initial reference circuit. So increasing the resonance frequency and moving the resonance point to higher values can sometimes help in attenuating this problem. Once all component choice and layout related measures have been depleted, the last common measure is the addition of a snubber circuit. Depending on the use case, multiple implementations are used, but I will focus on the most basic type, 
the RC resistor capacitor snubber. So with the buck converter, the snubber is commonly used in parallel with the low side transistor. Since the spike it usually attenuates is the oscillation that occurs when the low side is open and the high side is transitioning. At this moment, the elements in our RLC circuit are the sum of the various inductances, the various resistances, and we have the low side capacitance. So the summer, which is in parallel with this low side capacitor, can be thought of as a set of components that changes the overall damping factor of our RLC circuit. So we're adding both capacitance and resistance to increase the damping factor, but since this should only work at very high frequencies, at the ringing frequency, it should not affect the low frequency behavior of the power supply. Now, this is only partly true, of course, the snubber will add losses to the circuit, but the benefit is that it will dampen the oscillation and reduce its amplitude. So it's a compromised bit of circuitry. Therefore, you should only add it when it's actually needed. Now, there are multiple ways to calculate the needed values for a snubber, but these all require the knowledge of the parasitic inductance and capacitance. So I prepared the simulation to highlight some of these methods. So we start off from our reference circuit that we previously had, and I have two main methods of calculating these components. So we can start off by comparing our reference to the first set of components, so where the snubber resistor is 0.65 times the square root of the parasitic inductance divided by the parasitic capacitance, and the snubber capacitor is 8 times the parasitic capacitance, and then the other set of values uses a snubber resistor which is larger than or equal to the square root of the parasitic inductance divided by the parasitic capacitance, I use the equal value, and then the snubber capacitor is somewhere between 1 to 4 times the parasitic capacitance. So in all of these cases, the exact amplitude was reduced to a larger or smaller extent, and although these calculation methods are working, what is not considered, and well, not really easy to measure either, is the value of the series resistance present in the initial circuit. So the exact amount of damping that you will need will of course depend on the initial Q factor. So if we just take the last snubber values and we change the initial series resistance of the circuit, we again get different results. So in general, this sort of formulas are nice to start with, but practical verification and fine-tuning will always be necessary to get the best results. In the end, the oscillations and the voltage spikes that can get generated in the switching node of a switching converter need to be taken into account to, first of all, not exceed the operating limits of your components and ensure a safe and reliable long-term operation, and secondly, to reduce the noise output of the supply. To better understand the principles and implementations around this, Next time, I will be looking at the practical board from the beginning in more detail and try to improve on its response. But for now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.